Now, Michael spoke about the environmental crisis, but we all know that the environmental crisis cries into many, many other crises. You know, the social economic crisis, the inequality, the opiate crisis, just name it. And I would like to understand what is at the core. What is the cause? What is the cause of those crises we are now facing in the West 30 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, when we thought, you know, end of history, liberal democracy has won, all will be fine. Who? <laughs> okay, Eric, you have strong <laughs> views. Well, um, I think um, I enjoyed uh, Michael's uh, lecture very much this morning, uh, especially when he mentioned about liberal politics and its lineage beginning the Enlightenment, of course. Um, I, I think we are at um, at the end of a 300-year run of a liberal vision of the world. Um, however you want to call it, or maybe some, some call it the modern. Um, and, and I think uh, that vision is in some trouble, um, not predicting its demise, <laughs> Not yet, um, but it's in some trouble now because in the last 30 years to this day, uh, since the end of the Cold War, um, that liberals around the world have pursued a rather extreme uh, ideological version of modern liberalism, um, which precludes and excludes other possibilities. Uh, both intellectually and, and economically, um, to the point where I think the leader of the liberal world, the United States, of course, uh, had uh, committed what Paul Kennedy defined as imperial overreach, both externally and internally. Um, externally, it's, um, it's gone too far in trying to impose its vision on the rest of the world, on so many countries. Um, to some extent, in some cases militarily, uh, to rather disastrous consequences. Uh, and internally, um, it's taken this vision of the world which places the individual as the autonomous basic unit of society at the center of the universe. Internally, uh, it's gone pretty far since the Reagan and Thatcher revolution. Uh, with the neoliberal economic doctrine that has led to uh, tremendous inequality uh, in developed countries uh, that are uh, generating this backlash uh, against the liberal tradition, both the liberal tradition and, and globalization itself. Mm -hmm. um, and these problems are not being solved. Um, so, so I think that's partially how I see it from the outside, from a non-liberal society, uh, the trouble with, with the liberal vision. Jose Manuel, what, yeah. what's the cause of the many crises we are uh, facing? Uh, I think that, first of all, I agree that globalization is the main driver for this angst, this uh, anxiety that we have today in uh, our societies. I'm speaking now more about the Western societies, so mm -hmm. Europe and the Americas. Uh, I think that was certainly very much aggravated by the financial crisis and austerity policies and the impact that it had for in Europe. Mm -hmm. A very specific issue is this movement of refugees and uh, illegal migrants that has put a lot of pressure in some societies that uh, were not used to deal with multiculturalism or diversity, or they thought that they had enough of that. So and that creates a backlash. So there are many causes. There is not a single cause. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think we should avoid easy simplifications. In fact, that's one of the one of the intellectual devices, if I may say so, of populism, le grand simplificateur, is to make these kind of simplifications. I do not agree that we are in a worse position now than 30 or 40 years ago. In fact, I think we are in a better position now. Mm -hmm. If you look at Europe today, uh, okay, we are not happy with all the political systems and we are not happy with all the governments, but it's suddenly better than we had when we had half of Europe under totalitarian communism. I mean, it's much better. I mean, the situation in, in Poland or, or in any Central Eastern European country is better from all points of view. I mean, economically, you know, socially, in literacy terms, in openness, 
So I don't agree. If you look at Latin America also, it's better now than it was 30 or 40 years ago. But, 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 so I don't share the, what I call the intellectual glamour of pessimism. Today, it's very, probably it has to do also with the aging societies we have today in the West, uh, what they call culture pessimismus. Uh, Michael, I really enjoyed also your lecture before. I don't agree. I think we should avoid easy simplifications. We are certainly in a moment of transition uh, with some anxieties, also because politics matter, and in some cases we have very extremely bad, irresponsible leadership. There is, of course, a concern globally is that the global order that was created after the Second World War, mainly by the United States and by the so-called West, now the most important stakeholder, the United States, appear, appear not so committed as, as they were, which is quite interesting. So that creates this kind of enemy, this sense of, of disorder. Uh, but I believe, I continue to believe that democracies are over a long period much more resilient and much more able to perform for the public good than any other alternative. But that's something <laughs> else. Um, but uh, Mitchell, and, and, uh, where you come from, America, uh, at least Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders would agree with Wagner, right? I mean, that capitalism, uh, uh, this hardcore capitalism, and the billionaire class is one of the causes of the resentment, uh, the fear, uh, the problems in the West. Well, I, I think c certainly in the United States, the um, drastic growth of inequality, mm -hmm. um, significantly due to marketization of everything, including throughout the world, leaves a yawning gap which gets filled by a type of populist nativism when others aren't addressing it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think the consequences of it work on many levels and, and to some extent work globally, to some extent doesn't. I think we have um, economic questions and economic questions raising value questions such as what are the means and ends of life and what is the mm -hmm. intersection between them. It's led to political questions, dealing to quite with questions of, of the weaknesses of representative democracy and how we look to solve uh, or, or respond to those weaknesses. Um, the technological and communications revolution has added another layer, um, and all of this leads in a way to also some basic cultural and educational questions um, concerning how citizens of a society are educated um, in, in both cultural and political terms. The question I would pose to Eric is um, one of a, whether or not one believes in self-government and citizens self-governing. And so when you say there's one way hasn't worked, I, I don't, I, it's worked in some ways, it hasn't worked in others. Would one advocate self-government um, as a general norm? Or, or uh, even accepting the principle that um, you know, socialists used to argue about the preconditions of socialism. There are also preconditions of democracy. Um, but, but the question is whether self-government, regardless of, of uh, the origins of, its, uh, uh, of, of the idea, um, ought to be a norm or, or not. And that implies a concept of what citizenship means. Well, I think the concept of self-government is uh is an interesting and important one, uh, but the way we discuss it seems uh, always to oversimplify it. Um, obviously, since ancient time in China, for instance, it, it, even through the imperial dynasties, the idea is always the ruler must rule on behalf of the people. And the will of the people is predominant, is the most important thing for the legitimacy even of the emperor. Um, so what, what does self-governance mean? What does democracy mean, right? When we, uh, when we use the word democracy, I think most, most here really mean liberal democracy. Uh, there may be other forms of democracy. Is it possible? Is it possible? Um, uh, when, when you say self-governance, perhaps, I'm not sure what you mean, but maybe you mean liberal democracy, which is a well, particular... No, it, it means at a, at a minimum that the... Um that a, a, a ruler doesn't simply rule on behalf of the citizenry, but is also responsible to them. And they, That's right. Of course, are, they, are, are rulers, rulers ought to be held accountable to the people in some format. In some. So, so liberalism produces a particular set of procedures that make the rulers accountable. 
I don't think it's the only legitimate procedure to hold the rulers accountable. I'm, I'm, not, even, I, I'm not even sure if it's the most effective at this time. But, but let's, let's pause here for a moment and, and, and get back to it when we start to talk about uh, how power is uh, organized, because I, I'm, still not, uh, I'm still confused by Wagner's question, what causes the troubles in our society now? Uh, Sima, is, in your view, the Western liberal order the best of all worlds and worth fighting for? Or in the meantime, given all that has happened, you two have given up on the West and think, well, there is no better alternative? Uh, well, first of all, I'm happy to be among uh, so many distinguished people. I don't know if I'm... Um, I'm not an academician, so I don't know all these things, but I, uh, living in Afghanistan um, for, in a conflict country mm -hmm. since 41 years, uh, different superpower being involved and they were in the country. But what is missing in, in Afghanistan is actually respect for human rights. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the, co the cause of a lot of conflict everywhere, mm -hmm. including in Western countries. I mean, let's say Western countries were our supporter when the Russian invaded Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But was their support and their approach was to promote human rights and equality? Mm -hmm. Or promote accountability and justice in the country? R related to everything. So that's why I think we, as a human being, um, living everywhere, including in Western countries or Eastern countries, we need to think again and again that where do we go? Either if it's environmental crisis in the, in the world, or if it's uh, poverty, increasing poverty in the country, violation of human rights going on without notice, without uh, accountability, because there are some powers claiming to be liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. What they do, they, they're saying it's right, whatever they do. But if the other country does, then it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So that whole issue of, uh, of uh, superiority and knowing every, everything they, they, they think is right, I think doesn't work. Uh, me, as a human rights activist, I think our approach should be based on human rights, on everything. Let's say when we are talking about the SDG, for example, Sustainable Development Goal, and talking about the freedom of uh, expression and freedom of media in China, or uh, in other countries, what do we do if you're talking about the violation of human rights in China? Do we have the right to build the, all the different um, weapons to kill the people? Mm -hmm. And it's right that we can use every possible development of, of um, technology to suppress part of the people mm -hmm. in some way, because we don't like them. Mm -hmm. But then cry about the... Uh, lack of uh, freedom of expression in China. So which one? Mm -hmm. That's why I think there's a lack of equality and lack of accountability. And I think the culture of impunity continues for the so-called war crimes and crimes against humanity around the world. Mm -hmm. And the crimes are coming from all sides. From all sides. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I think we should look why there's an extremist, fundamentalist, not only yeah. in Islamic countries, but yeah. also in the other countries. Yeah, because to, to continue on this point, one of the themes of the ring is Wotan's betrayal. Um, Wotan betrays everybody uh, uh, all the time. And uh, if you go on YouTube and you listen to the many speeches Mr. Steve Bannon uh, gives, all Salvini, all those people, it's all about the betrayal of the elites the elites in the West. 
and those global elites uh, uh, who, according to Steve Brennan, uh, are above, and he's talking about uh, the people in Davos, etc., etc., etc. But the truth of the matter, you know, you don't have to be a fan of Mr. Bannon, which I'm absolutely not. Um, but if you see the kind of resentment everywhere in our society, um, and it's a resentment against those elites, which are, you know, they don't pay taxes, they are, they're in their own uh, uh, Valhalla, they preach a global blah, 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 and, and there's nothing they do. So... Who else? And, and, and what, 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 is, there, is, there, or is there a misunderstanding? Is there a lack of communication? Is there a lack of marketing? Or is there indeed a point that, like the uh, gods in, in, in the, in the Götterdam room, uh, they only take care for themselves and they are not interested in, quote unquote, the people? I'm ha actually happy to say that I've never heard Steve, Steve Bannon's any of his speeches. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, as I as I listen to this discussion uh, from my perspective, and there's obviously a lot of concern with what's going on in the United States, the, mm -hmm. the, the whole liberal order and the institutions that were put together after World War II. And, and in fact, a friend of mine said the other day, and this was just kind of a striking statement that one of Roosevelt's advisors <clears throat> said that uh, this order will last as long as those of us who participated in this are around. And, and that really struck me because they are almost gone. Um, and I, I don't know if that's right or wrong, but certainly in this time, things are changing dramatically. Uh, my own view in the United States, it, it is the inequality that has led us here. Uh, it isn't, and certainly the elite have benefited from that. But we also have, in the, United, in the U.S., uh, a political class that is completely out of touch, in, in my view, with the American people, and, a, and an ethos uh, in Washington that is very power-centric, fueled by legally corrupt money uh, that have in their, main, in their main goal is to stay in power. Uh, and, and I've seen it, and this isn't the last three years, I've watched this grow over the course of certainly the last 20 or so when I was in Washington. Uh, and I think that is at the core of the resentment uh, on the part of the people of the United States, the disappearance of what we used to call the American dream, where everybody sort of had an equal shot, um, uh, and the complete lack of accountability, we've heard accountability multiple times uh, here, the complete lack of accountability on the part of anybody in a position of power. Uh, the game is much more uh, specific in terms of blaming somebody as opposed to holding themselves accountable for their own actions or their own outcomes, uh, et cetera. And a re-election rate that is typically in Washington in the 85 to 95 percent uh, every two years, uh, you know, at that level. So we have a political class that uh, is incredibly powerful. It is in unto it. it. It basically is focused on itself and sustaining itself far above meeting the requirements, the education requirements, the economic requirements, the fiscal requirements, the the the, the investment requirements across every aspect of who we are as a people, th that our political class has failed completely. Well, I couldn't agree more, uh, but who am I? Uh, but, but more importantly, um, and this is also a question to you, uh, 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 Michael, given your great plea for uh, you know, sensible liberalism, let me put it this way. Vaclav Favel gave his famous lecture for the US Congress in 1990. And at the end of his uh, 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 speech at Congress, U.S. Congress, he said, "We still do not, we still don't know how to how to put morality ahead of politics, science, and economics. We are still incapable of understanding that the only genuine backbone of our activities is responsibility, responsibility to something higher than my family, my country, my firm, my success." So this is this big plea of Havel to everybody. Uh, and the whole power class in, in, in the United States of America to put moral values first.
And his question already then was, why are we not doing it? Why is that the political class, like Mike Mullen just said, not doing that? Despite the fact that apparently things are going well. I'd want a historian like Peter to weigh in here. I, I, don't, have, I don't have good answers here. I, I think that um, Admiral Milken, Ed Millen raised a very important point when he quoted that guy saying, this will last as long as we last. These things are heavily generational. I, I, I think that um, the liberal politics that I inherited, I inherited from the Roosevelt generation from, 19, from the 1930s, these were people who'd seen the capitalist system almost collapse. They'd seen unemployment not at 10% or 12%, but at 30%, 40%. The country literally going, going down the drain. They'd gone through a global war of unimaginable horror. Um, and then we had 40 years after that, which Thomas Piketty's statistics mm -hmm. show you, in which, because income inequality was very, very radically compressed during the de Depression because of a eradication of wealth and then the collective mobilization during the Second World War in which the state, the liberal state, suddenly had a huge power. <clears throat> that lasted for 30 years. I grew up in a, in a world in which income inequality in my country, Canada, was, and I think the United States is saying, very sharply compressed. There's a period between 45 and 1973 when income inequality basically keeps reproducing the pattern of compressed inequality that we saw in the Depression and the Second World War. And my parents' generation came back from the Second World War, <clears throat> professionals in, a, in, a, in, in, in their fields, deeply affected by the solidarity of the Second World War, emotionally affected by a sense that we were all in this together. My father, my mother had this passionate sense as liberals that it was one society. We were going to build it. We are going to rebuild it. I think we... And then from the 70s onwards, the numbers are remorseless. We begin to see an upward tick in inequality. We don't understand all of its drivers, some of its new technology, some of its self-dealing, some of its liberal professions doing better out of the economy than they really should. I mean, there's some self-dealing, there's some technological change. But it has fractured. I think you're quite right. It's fractured the society. That old generation has died out. The Roosevelt generation has died out. My mom and dad are dead, as it were. And we are the heirs of a new world that's very unfamiliar to us. <clears throat> the other thing we're heir to, and this would pick up uh, what our, uh, Eric has been saying, is we're living the end of empire. This is a huge development. You, you go back then to 45. You know, in 1945, the Netherlands had an empire. Uh, the Belgians had an empire. The French had an empire. The British had an empire. Flash forward to 2019, the one damn thing that I think is uniformly positive is we're in a post-imperial era. But it then cuts uh, in, a, in a different way. I'm a Canadian. I grew up dependent on American hegemony. My whole vision of the world was there was a liberal democratic state that would do the wrong thing until the, end of, until the last moment, then kind of do the right thing. We're in a new world. The passage of that American hegemony, the emergence of, let's be frank, and, and all respect to China, a great civilization, but this is a single party, this is a single party state. And it's taking us, if this is the power that generates or dominates the 21st century, it's an unfamiliar world. I do not think China will be the new empire, but the idea that the world is led by a single party state um, causes anxiety. And, and in a post-imperial world, a post-imperial world is wonderful because we get back to self-determination, in my view. We get back to the nation state as the driver of politics, but we're, we're, we're suddenly in a world without the hegemon that used to have an association of democratic values, and now we're into a, a new world. I think that produces a great deal of anxiety. <clears throat> to get back to the moral point, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that the morality of politics is a historical phenomenon. It was created in the 1930s. It lasted till the 1970s. It has not survived 
the emergence of the new inequality. It has not survived the end of empire. We now have to recreate an, a morality of politics for a 21st century, which is totally different than the, than the, the moral and political world of my parents. Thank you, Mike. My, is, is there a connection, Eric, between uh, uh, Michael and, 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 and Admiral Mullen's statement of the lack of solidarity and the rise of individualism you described as part of Western society? And then the question is, and maybe Alexander can tell us also a little bit more about it, what's the connection between living in a capitalist commercial society and the lack of solidarity and fragmentation uh, and individualism, which we are now facing and which is part of the resentment movement. Alexander. Well, I think one, uh, one reason for the crisis um, that you sort of uh, spoke about at the outset is that we're in a weird transitional phase where, where, um, where the political mainstream political discussions are sort of 20th century discussions, more or less between what still the conflict what used to be left and what used to be right when uh, um, this conflict more or less will be rendered moot um, or it has been rendered moot because it will be decided by technology to a, to a large extent i mean given that uh, you know we're heading towards um you know a, an age of technical technological unemployment which will require more or less a a more redistributive approach or obviously who knows how bad it's and how quickly it's going to get bad or really bad with um, uh, the environmental crisis and that could also force sort of uh, disruptive changes in, in the social compact. So a lot of these discussions are, are sort of shadow boxing um, <clears throat> of dying belief systems and, and I think that once this rubble and this is cleared and this dust settles, then we're going to arrive at a more sort of very analytical and fact-based view of, of politics that you can already see in, in this post-millennial generation of activists. Um, of course, the most famous figurehead being Greta Thunberg, whose, whose very simple and powerful message is unite behind the science. And, uh, and this whole environmental movement obviously lends itself well to, to, to sort of um, being the catalyst for this shift towards a more sort of rational and less ideological worldview because the evidence is so clear and the stakes are so high and, and, and obviously even kids can completely understand this, uh, this IPPC, uh, IPCC report and, and the drastic uh, uh, implications and get completely involved in this. So um, if, we, if we do move to this sort of more, more um, um, rational view, that of course will then will leave no, no stone unturned in, in, in uh, for example, in Germany, it would mean that they ha would have to address sort of um, logical fault lines in their, in their established political narrative, as in any other country probably. But in Germany, for example, it would mean exiting nuclear energy, um, which is sort of the, the, um, the, the life's topic of, of, all, uh, of, of the entire left wing in Germany. <coughs> and they would have to re-examine that decision, given that um, it makes no sense to exit nuclear energy in order to save the environment. It just makes no sense at all, given uh, according to this new research. <laughs> um, or also um, proliferation even. Now, you know, Germany used to uh, rely on the, on the uh, nuclear umbrella provided by the United States. Um, that obviously is no longer reliable, not just because of Donald Trump, but because of... Uh, in, in a way, nuclear power cannot really be shared if it's, you know, in a post-bloc world. Um, but you can't just really ignore these, these sort of glaring um, illogical faults. Mm -hmm. And, and at, uh, after these things have been addressed, then I think at some point, if we really are being, if this new generation of voters is rational and not ideological, then sort of a, a, a glaring a moral dilemma will at some point emerge, um, ha, you know, having to do with global inequality. So uh, say you're, you're sitting in a hotel bar and you decide to order a bottle of wine for 100 euros to, um, after a busy day, and in the time that it takes for the bottle of wine to arrive on your phone, you can research um, uh, through vaccinations in the third world or something of this nature, how much it would cost statistically to save one human life. 
and say it, it turns out to be also around 100 euros. Then what do you do? Do you say, um, I'm just going to put this out of my mind because I want to drink the bottle of wine, or, uh, which would you know, be by any standard in a moral decision? Or do you accept um, that this, you know, sort of the state of perfect information we're going into that gives you this kind of information at your fingertips, wherever you are, you accept that I'm not going to ignore this and I'm going to sort of press the one-click uh, button on my, on my charity app and, not, and you know, have you know, just like a glass of water instead. Um, and if once you do accept that, though, then you're really on a slippery slope, basically, because where does it end? You yeah, know? Or, you, or you spend 200. No, imagine you, no, but I mean, seriously, imagine you have an app that combines 100 different avenues mm -hmm. of charity, and you can scan a product yes. you're about to buy, and then it shows you bundles of life-saving sure. measures sure. that you could buy instead. Yeah, well, um, okay, so, okay, listen, it's, 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 no, it, it, it's obvious that we are, you know... Rob wants to stick with his wine. Yeah. <laughs> We're moving to, to something uh, new. Peter, we haven't heard you uh, uh, yet. Now, in the new Silk Roads, the new Silk Roads, you claim, quote unquote, the age of the West is at crossroads, if not at the end. Why? Um, okay, I will answer that. But I want to pick up one, Michael, first oh. about saying we're in a post-imperial age, which I, I don't agree with at all, by the way. Okay. Uh, partly because uh, Brexit is going to deliver a new empire, I think. Where? Because Theresa May, um, when she gave her first speech when she became prime minister, she said, uh, we're going to deliver Brexit and Britain's best days lie not behind us, but in front of us. And for historians who only need to look back 100 years to see 25% of the world's population paid taxes to London 100 years ago, I assume that means we're going to get another empire. <laughs> <laughs> and, we will join, and we will join the very small group of those who've had an empire twice, which includes, as all of you will know, uh, the Bulgarians. It's very rare to have an empire twice, but the Bulgarians had two empires. Everyone should know about this. Um, but we don't, in the same way that no one knows that the biggest empire that Europe has seen uh, has been the Lithuanians, right, land empire. We, we, our, our, our idea of perspective is a challenge, and that feeds into all of these kind of things. But we're not just, that's a bit flippant about post-imperial. We are, we are an imperial age because there are new kinds of empires that are being built, right? Um, and you know, there's a cache of, of uh, documents uh, captured by the US military about five years ago, profiling... Um, ISIS recruits from Western European countries, and their profile is almost exactly the same as Silicon Valley founders. And the new empires that are being built are the disruptive 25, 26 year olds, high levels of education, highly incentivized to, to destabilize and take advantage of weaknesses in the systems or to, to, to break things for their own idea of what their empire will look like. As it happened, ISIS's exper ex experiment didn't work too well. But Facebook, Google, these kinds of new entities that don't look like the traditional ways that empires do, have the same kinds of powers, those kind of morality questions that Alice is talking about on a much an infinitesimal sort of scale. And so some of that I think we need to be careful how we sort of calibrate, how we think about the world around us. And, and I think, again, going back to um, what Mike said, Ramal Mullen said about, um, about the failure of, this, of states in the US particularly, but also in, in other Western democracies too, is that, is that to an extent in the post-war scenario for the next 45 years, there were calibrations, there were, the reins were kept on the political class because the definition was against a defined and clear adversary and enemy. And, and one of Admiral Mullen's predecessors, a chair of the Joint Chiefs, Colin Powell, in, in 89 when the wall came down, said the only thing that he's worried about now is about being excessively bored because there wasn't anything to worry about. Now the Soviet Union had come to an end and so on. And I, I don't mean that to, you know, what I, what I mean is that, is that when you have to deal with new worlds, those new structures, those structures that you've relied on start to change. And over the last 30, 40 years, one of the challenges has been as the wall came down and the, the, the new world has emerged is that Western countries have become more like feudal states because the incentives for elites to acquire wealth and position of power and to retain those have meant that right now, according to research done in Sweden, in the United Kingdom and the USA, and, and, and Holland will not be far behind, um, the chances of you staying if you're born in the bottom 20% are significantly higher than if you're born today in Sierra Leone or Niger or Kazakhstan. And that means that you have a, a, a trap where the people who are poorest in society will start to make demands about the fact that they are not being heard. And those demands could head towards the hard left, with per perfectly good reason, or towards the hard right and the Bannon, who is talking about things that are real. You know, inequality is real. 
The elites are not listening. They are failing you. And that's why it's so dangerous, because there is, that powder is dry for a reason, and it's, it's, it's not impossible to, uh, to exploit that. But there are consequences of those feudal problems of power, of failures of the politicians, of failures of the political systems, of the uh, widening of society, the incentivization of companies to buy political power and influence and tax cuts and whatever it might, might be. Uh, but there are other problems too. It means that our, 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 our multilateral organizations start to look uh, wrong. So Mike Pompeo, the current Secretary of State uh, in Brussels at the end of last year, he said, if the United Nations, the World Trade, Trade Organization, or the European Union are not reformed, they should be eliminated, mm. right? These are, these are words that, not just uh, a, a, an important and powerful figure, but we should be paying a great deal of attention to why it is that we in the West think we're at a loose end, because as far as I'm concerned, Afghanistan, Iraq, and certain countries around the world are not excluded, but I feel a great deal safer today than I did as a child of the Cold War, where every Friday at my school we had a drill to hide under a table in case there was a nuclear attack, uh, where we had three-day weeks and energy shortages. We had problems about food supply. You know, we had the PLO, we had ad ad aircraft hijackings all the time. You know, our, the safety of our world and the prosperity, we've come to take for granted because we have no perspective. Right? And if you don't pay attention to history, and in my particular view, not just European history and the history of the West, but to this much bigger picture, then, then you lose the uh, ability to look in the right direction. So the West is at a crossroads for this reason, but other countries, other populations, see things in a very different way. So by 2050, 80% of the world's population will live in Africa or in Asia, right? Not in Amsterdam, not in London, not in whatever. And so Europe becomes a corollary. It can help direct, it can help influence, it can benefit and pay also the price if it gets things wrong. But you start with history, you start with discussions about power, political systems and so on. You start with demographics, you start with climate, and you start with resources. And I agree with every single word of Michael's extremely eloquent speech, but humans have interfered and messed up climate since the beginning of time. You know, forests being cleared, for stock fish being overstocked, we can do it much more efficiently. We can destroy the environment much faster and produce these climate changes too. But the founding fathers in the United States were obsessed about the, 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 about the fact that when uh, agricultural land was being cleared in the eastern part of the United States, that this was changing the way in which um, we'd be able to live and survive. Florida was too cold to live in in the 1600s, right? So this is all part of a, a process that we, we, we start when you look at history, climates and geography, demographics and natural resources, and you follow where those distributions come from. And, and Europe has had a, like Eric says, whichever way you look at it, despite Theresa May, who, by the way, she said she never read history, um, never, like, never liked reading it. She, it's a quote, she only gave her first interview was to British Vogue. She said, I never read history books. I like to make things up as they go along. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, I, it, it makes me, it doesn't give Trump me any pride, I promise you, to see what's going on right now in the UK with our Brexit discussion. But there is a, there is a, there is a clear signaling of problems if, you, if you're not able to look, in the, look at the problem in the right way, because of course you're going to have the wrong kind of solutions. Um, uh, Peter, is... Uh... In your book, you also write that the Mediterranean uh, uh, was not the cradle of civilization, but the cradle of civilization is. In it, it wasn't. Democracy wasn't born in Athens. Democracy was born in Mesopotamia, the first city states <laughs> that allowed elections, that allowed citizens' rights, that no, produced I, I, laws. I, I, you can't function as a state without laws. And laws are designed to protect. Human rights is part of that, but law is about protecting people, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's designed to protect people being exploited. That's a whole, whole function of, of, of what the state should do. The state's job is to make society more fair, more open, more meritocratic. And states that make that work have been prosperous. So the Yongle Emperor in China, for example, in 1400, he said, the best gift my father gave me was 40 years when nothing happened. Peace and stability are massively underrated. Mm -hmm. you know, as Hegel says, the pages of peace in history books are the, are the ones with no words on, because we love war. We love revolution, we love change, we love apocalyptic views, we love drama, and we love crisis. And actually, most normal people would say, in my home environment, I don't want any crisis at all. I will settle for boredom and a quiet Friday night any day of the week. <laughs> I'll be quiet now. I'll, I'll, no, 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 I'm, I'm no, 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 you, you, you're not allowed to be quiet. Listen, and, um, do we like war, Admiral Mullen? Uh, 
uh, empirically, it's hard to say that we don't. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, as I was and, and listening to the conversation in terms of uh, certainly what the U.S. has done, and I personally think that Iraq, the decision on Iraq was a disaster. And you may recall okay. that we were going to light the flame of democracy, I think. Uh, and definitions of terms are really important. And one of my learnings uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and in other places, um, the, the, the flame of democracy gets lit initially if you have some semblance of a rule of, a rule of law. If you, if you made me prioritize uh, impacting a country, it would be first and foremost to put in a rule of law from which an awful lot of other things would grow, which was the exact opposite of what we did both in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, uh, that, so that's one thought. The, the other is, um, in, in all of this, and it, possibly just because it's, it's how I grew up from a leadership perspective, I think leaders really matter. And I don't think we spend enough time talking about how leaders get created in the current world. Uh, we talk a lot about how they get destroyed, and we watch them seemingly on the sidelines with glee as they get destroyed. What we don't talk about much is those who could lead, uh, who might be watching this, that would say, well, that's something I'm never going to do. But my biggest concern globally, quite frankly, is we have, is we, we have virtually no leaders that align with values that I cherish, Western values, uh, to move us forward. Uh, and the two leaders, notionally, who are moving the needle in the world right now are Putin and Xi Jinping, and they're not the top of my list in terms of the guys I want to move the needle. So in this, you know, in this, the, the, the description of where we are and why, it's almost futile if we don't have leaders who can move us forward. And I don't know where they're going to come from. Uh, because right now, politically, uh, you have to get, you, you virtually have to get destroyed to survive. And how many people really want to take themselves and their families through that? And this isn't just in the US. I see this you know, across the globe, certainly in, the, in, in countries that I value from a Western value standpoint. Uh, it, it is amazing to me sometimes what I see happening in my own country and how much that is being replicated uh, you know, globally in, in other countries uh, that we are tied to. So that leadership piece is a huge, huge piece, and where does it come from? We'll get back to that in a second, but I want to, to tie in, in, in what you just said, and also for you, Jose Manuel, and, and for you, Sima. What, because the, 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 the ring is about also about the fact that Wotan has to, you know, is, 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 has to deal with his own laws and rules and, uh, and it becomes a mess and so then he creates Siegfried to get out of it. But what are the consequences if a rule-based international order is now replaced more and more by the age-old might makes right? I mean, Trump is no longer interested in rule-based order. Macron said the NATO is brain uh, 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 that, and it's, you know, um, the struggle of the fittest, more or less. Well, we're back in the jungle. That's where, I may, I may be biased, but that's where I think Europe is so important. I think a world, a uh, trump she world, it will be a problem. Why? Uh, with all respect, because uh, for the United States or China, two countries that I know relatively well, that I visit. Because Europe, we are really committed, probably because of our experience of the terrible wars, two world wars, in fact, start as civil European wars. We should not forget that the most awful events of mankind history were here in Europe, and the more developed part of Europe, namely Germany, so that's where it started. The most, probably the most tragic event of mankind, Shoah, happened here in Europe. So the history of Europe is the history of wars, except the last 60 years after the European community was created, where we had no war in European community territory. We had the war, uh, in fact, still there somehow, uh, with, uh, created by Russia uh, in, uh, in, um, in Ukraine and also Georgia, and we had in the Balkan Wars. But European community countries, today we think, and I think basically it's a good, a good, um, good way of seeing things, that it's 
war between European countries, European community, European countries, is not possible or is even unthinkable. So the European Union has an experience now of understanding that the nation is not absolute. And I want to make that point because I think we have evoked this sometime here. The philosophical, the question is what we consider the real important value. Is it the state? Is it the party? Is it an ideology? Is it a class? Or is it a human being? That's the point. Some people call it individualism, but I, I prefer to call it humanism or personalism. So the question is, if you think that our country, we love our countries, I think most of us, I mean, I love my country, we are patriotic, my country has almost 900 years of existence, Portugal, so I love my country, but I think it is not in contradiction to be citizen of Europe, and also, why not to say, citizens of the world, by the way, that's right. I remember yeah. the Prime Minister of Britain recently that against the tradition of cosmopolitanism said that uh, citizens of the world are citizens of nowhere. I think we can be patriotic and be citizens of the world and care about human rights. And so, and to love mankind, but I think it was Dostoevsky, there is a personage there that says, my father loved mankind in general, but he hated every individual in particular. Right. So that, that's not, a, the question is, to mankind is not an abstract concept, like the party, the class, the nation, the state. Mankind means every man, every woman, every child. And this is why the focus philosophically has to be on the person, the human being. And that's why freedom is so important. And I believe that with all its imperfections, the free world is more able than other parts of the world to respond to human needs. But then I still want... I, I, but why do you think that Europe can deliver uh, this and not Europe, China I mean, or America? No, I mean, first of all, we have Europe... We are not perfect. We have a lot of problems. But in fact, in Europe, we have that culture of multilateralism. So we believe in an order of rules, global order of rules, at least current Europe. I mean, the Netherlands, the countries we are here very close, they believe in a world of rules mm -hmm. with some principles, with some values. So um, geopolitically, of course, Europe has not the same weight as the United States had to remain, in spite of all the difficulties, the most influential country in the world, or China, who has been the most important history. I think the most important fact of the last 30, 40 years is suddenly the rise of China. Everything is different after the rise of China. And by the way, in Europe, I think we have interest in having a strong China, not a weak China, but that's a, for probably uh, another discussion. And that's, I, I really believe it's a mistake some of the policies that some people are now trying to shape against China, I believe that we have interest in a strong China. Now, the question is, how can we... Europe... Europe look, now I can share with you some of my political experience. After all, uh, I think I'm the only, probably, uh, that was very active in politics around this table. And uh, when I go to the G20, for instance, the G8, but the G20, who takes decisions in the G20? That's where the real power is. We're speaking about power. Let's speak about power. Where is the real power globally? Those who take decisions globally. Basically, it's the United States and China and Europe when we are together. Russia, all the decisions after the financial crisis from, all the decisions were taken basically by the United States, by the other countries that participate in the 20, I mean, from, from Japan to Saudi Arabia to Korea uh, to Argentina, okay, are very interesting contributions, but the real power is United States, China, some extent Russia. Russia is now trying to revive. But in fact, economically, they don't, they, they don't have the means of their ambition. So it's a question. They have the will, but not the, the means. While China today has the will and the means. The United States have the means, but apparently not the will with the current administration in terms of trying to, to, to shape the world. And Europe has the means, but not the will. Why Europe, not? Why not? Because, because we are still fragmented. And in matters where we require power, I mean hard power, geopolitical power, we are not ready. But by the way, if I want to be a little bit provocative, I say that today there are at least three factors that are uniting Europe. Brexit. Mm -hmm. Until now, it has been remarkable how the other countries are united in the way to deal with Brexit. Yep. Putin, because many people are afraid uh, in Europe, namely our centrist and European countries, of Putin's initiatives. And Trump. Because, in fact, when the President of the United States 
uh, creates mistrust on NATO, the Europeans, including what you said about Germany, I mean, people in Germany now, and that's completely new, that would be impossible five years ago, are saying, should we rely on that or should we not try to create our own capacity as Europeans, as Germany, as, as Europeans, until now, and I think Germany is one of the most loyal countries to the European Union, and by in France. So, now, it's going to be the European way. We are not going to have the United States of Europe tomorrow. I don't believe there will have the disintegration of the European Union, but not the United States. We are not going to have a Philadelphia moment. Europe, by definition, is frustrating. <laughs> it's fragmented, slow, time-consuming, muddling through. So, uh, uh, but, you know, I may be biased in fact of Europe, but I remember during the financial crisis, when most people, including G20 or G8, or, or the most important financial experts, were telling me and the European, that Greece will be unavoidable. Greece was going to leave the euro, and Greece is still there. So the resilience of the European Union is higher than most people acknowledge. And I'm no longer in public office, so I think my level of sincerity is growing day by day. <laughs> you may believe what I'm trying to say. But what Jose Manuel, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. One Sima? Uh, well, I think. I'm not European, but we are impacted by everybody, by, by China, by America, by Europe, and by their policies in Afghanistan. As I said that we are in 41 years of war, everybody is involved, but no one, including us as an Afghan, we are not learning from history. That is one of the problem. Uh, what was happened, of course, in 1979 and 78, when the coup d'etat and then the Russian invasion, the European and the American and the Arab countries, they choose the most conservative group of people and they train them as a fundamentalist Islamist to defeat U USSR on that time. When U USSR has collapsed, then they left Afghanistan. They left us on our own, with poverty, with really a destroyed country. And then what's happened? We had Taliban and then Mujahideen government, and now we have everybody. <laughs> so I think what is, what is really important, and I insist, that our policies everywhere, the, the democracy, liberalism, and everything, should be based on human rights and respect for human dignity. We do not do that. On the business side, you, you see Chinese, or you see the European countries, or you see the US. I mean, the whole policy of few people who are very rich in the companies and the consortiums, they really focus on making money. They don't care about the people. They, the growing poverty and the growing inequality around the world will be more, uh, cause more war and more fighting and more violation of human rights. European, with all these uh, morality that they claim, how they send back the, the I, I'm talking about my own people who they send back, deport them back to Afghanistan. So we are making the conventions, we are making all the rule of law, and then we don't respect. We choose one when it has benefited us. We do not choose the others the violation of human rights, I mean, the, the, the environment. And the, the environment crisis will cause a lot of problem for, this, for all of us. And we choose the one we want, and we attack the other one which we do not want. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the amount of money that we all spend on, on making weapons and using, making different kind of guns and the, more, the most advanced uh, bombs, the biggest bomb, because we had the biggest, the mother bomb they called, that they dropped in Afghanistan. That they, Moab. Yes, no, US. that was the US. Yes. It wasn't they, it was us. Yeah, well, we know that they're the, the most powerful <laughs> country in the world. I've spent a lot of my life being they. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, actually. <laughs> Instead of blaming everything on you as an American around this table. But <clears throat> no one is responsible. No one is keeping them accountable. Mm -hmm. just, can, can I just add one, uh, in, in, in particular with respect to Afghanistan, 
uh, and, and my heart breaks with where we are right now and all you and your people have been through without, I'm not overly optimistic even now about how this, how this turns out. But, uh, and, and to, to, partially to what you were saying about the impact of Europe and the potential of Europe, it was, uh, and I can't remember exactly when, but in the last few years, at one point, there were 49 countries that had military capability in Afghanistan as part of the coalition. Yes, yeah, absolutely. 49 countries. And, and when you think about, think about the political, economic, diplomatic, uh, education, think about the resources of those countries put to work in this coalition uh, beyond just the military capability. And, and, and in those 49 countries, there was a huge amount of political capital for investing in those military capabilities committed to the coalition. And yet, in the end, we did, we'll, we will do what we did in Afghanistan the last time, we'll walk away. We will do what we recently did in Libya, where we had a large coalition, and then when it was done, even after a quote-unquote free and fair election, mm -hmm. we leave some poor individual to run a country that hasn't had a functioning institution for 40 years to say, just figure it out. Um, and it, it, it absolutely, uh, I, I can't, I, it, it befuddles me completely that we would make these kinds of commitments and not include the totality of who we are as opposed to just the military side of who we are. And we need, we're better than that. We really are better than that. Well, I think, if I may uh, add to that, I think there was 49 countries soldier in Afghanistan. Um, from some of the small country in the in the Europe who had only 10 right. medical medical uh, staff in the ground in the US who had 130,000 forces but there was lack of coordination and lack of clear vision what they want to do so all those lives and all those money which was spent in Afghanistan Nobody focused on rule of law, as you said, that there should be rule of law and good governance in the country. So we could have done much better yeah. if there was a united approach. And again, I insist, if there was, our approach would, would have been on protection of human rights and the protection of people and people's dignity in the country. That was not the case. They were not even talking to each other. They were not sharing the information to each other. <laughs> Canadian was in Kandahar, for example. Europe, uh, Norway was in, in Faryab somewhere. The other German was in, in the north. But they were not sharing the information to learn from each other. And they were not coordinating with Afghan government. I'm not saying that we had a very strong institution. We still don't have a strong institution. But there was a nominal or a government in the country which could have been involved on the decision making. But one story you might tell here is that the, if you want freedom, if you want democracy, you have to build it yourself. I think there's a, there's a pathos to these stories about Afghanistan, to Syria, to, to Iraq, uh, but also to the Balkans where I was very much involved. And the external interventions have been almost uniformly negative, I mean, with some exceptions. I don't want to get, I mean, it's clear that Dayton um, helped to keep uh, the Balkan War from going on. But, but I come out of this thinking that the stories you actually, in the post-89 world, you want, to <clears throat> you want to look at are a place like Ghana. It's a country that goes down, has a very bad period of authoritarian rule, very corrupt kleptocratic rule, and has now had three or four successive free and fair elections. Ghana's doing it itself. And I, I do no, take... I, I fully I take, agree with I you. I take that lesson being an optimistic one. If you want freedom, if you want democracy, you've got to do it. You've got to do it yourself. Outsiders can help. We can help a little bit at the margins. But unless there's a constituency at home that is willing to 
go I all the way, agree. it can't happen. I fully agree. Let me, let me say a few sentences. The main force in any country is the, may, the people of that yeah. country. But the international community can facilitate yes. and empower that people to promote yeah. democracy. Yeah. Sure. That cannot be done through bombs. <clears throat> True enough. True. It should be done through education and other basic social services and, and training and building empowerment, empowering the people of that country. So uh, we appreciate yeah. the support of the, the, yeah. the other countries for Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the problem in Afghanistan is not finished, and it will trouble the other countries as we did before. Yeah. Although it, we were not part of the 9-11, it was all the other countries who may be the, those boys who, who did the... Mm -hmm the atrocity in, in New York and, and uh, Washington. Maybe they were in Afghanistan, but they, none of them were Afghan. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, want, I want to go to another place where there are problems, which is Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, you have uh, uh, a few million people who are promoting, fighting, protesting to keep their sense of freedom and democracy. And there is that civilizational state, China, who, if I read the newspapers well, uh, has a problem uh, with those millions of people who are fighting for their freedom and democracy. Um, what's the problem with China? Leave those people alone. Well, um, <laughs> they hadn't been left alone. Uh, they were ruled by Britain for a long time. Yes. Uh, oh, the, the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> the the Brit <laughs> but by, by force, by the way, through wars, of course. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, and, and Hong Kong came back to China peacefully. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's an important distinction here. It was taken by force, returned in peace. Uh, and that's a great achievement. Um, and, and in Hong Kong, we have this uh, structure called one country, two systems, which means that Hong Kong has this thing called the basic law. It's a mini constitution so that it's autonomous, it's an autonomous region, it's called a special administrative region, so it runs its own economy, its own legal system, uh, and its own way of selecting leaders. Um, and the current protests, of course, are driven, you, there are many interpretations. Um, um, I, I mean, I, I tend to see it as being driven in part uh, by a lot of economic grievances uh, that also inequality, actually. Um, there, there was a lot of undercurrents, but also uh, these undercurrents have been politicized uh, into dissatisfaction with the one country, two systems approach. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Um, so, so obviously you cannot break that system. It's like trying to break the Constitution of the United States. Um, so, so Hong Kong will need to um, within the legal framework, within its constitutional framework, it needs to find, I hope it will, a way forward to solve these problems uh, in a peaceful manner uh, and, and, and in, a, in a manner that respects the rules that are currently governing the territory. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, we, I'm confident eventually they will get there. I mean, the, the, these protests have been violent at times, but. And, uh, but not nearly as violent as the ones being taken place in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, not even close. <coughs> and, and the police uh, tactics not nearly as aggressive as, as the Parisian police. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in comparison, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm rather sanguine. I'm, you know, I, um, Eric, in the, uh, you please. Yes. Can you just take that same discussion, Eric, to Taiwan and kind of how you see because I think my own view is I think the West misinterprets, easily misinterprets uh, where Taiwan is, where it's headed, the relationship, uh, the one China policy and how that actually is going right now, particularly in the face of an election here in Taiwan in the very near future. Well, again, um, it's part of history. Um, well, history is so important here. I mean, Taiwan was, I mean, Ch China emerged after World War II. Uh, in tatters, the country had you know had a hundred some years of horrible uh, time uh, being invaded, colonized, um, and yet it emerged 
in one piece after World War II, luckily, uh, in bad shape, but in one piece. Um, so it, it, you know, its goal is to reunify the Chinese nation um, and as part of national aspiration. And Taiwan obviously is a part of that. And the current Taiwan constitution says that it is part of China. Um, so, so it is an aspiration, you could say, on, on, on both sides of the strait. Uh, although I do recognize there are people in Taiwan, sizable part, part of the population, who want Taiwan to be an independent country. Uh, but as you know, these are very difficult goals. It's, it's, it's always difficult. I mean, in, in America, to be independent from Britain, it came with wars and bloodshed and extraordinary violence. Um, so, so this is not an easy proposition. Um, um, and and, and I, I, mean, I, I, would, I, I hope one day the Chinese nation will be unified in one. That, that's our goal. But, but Eric Schell, you, you gave an interview for uh, NRC um, in which you mentioned that the legitimacy of the Communist Party, which has total control of your country, um, is based because of the people. It's the people of China who legitimizes the Communist Party, right? Um, but talking about uh, of, of what Michael uh, uh, mentioned, uh, if you read other reports of what's happening in China, there is a politics of fear, uh, there is this surveillance, the, the credit system, there is even a kind of gulag, where re-education camps. I mean, what's the real legitimation of this Communist Party? Well, um, I think the legitimacy of any ruler or any rule on a long-term basis must be rested upon whether it delivers for a vast majority of the people that they govern. Okay? If they fail to that, do that for long duration, they will lose their legitimacy, period. And, and this is something not to be complacent about. Um, and and uh, my analysis is that the, the, the party has been successful so far is because they have this sense of crisis, this sense of they're not complacent. They keep thinking, what can we do to keep delivering? Uh, that's what I worry about liberal societies uh, because they have, as an, again, from, as an outside observer, okay, I'm not, uh, the, the liberal societies have these rulers, these elites, that somehow take their legitimacy for granted. So they say, we're legitimate because we're liberal. <laughs> Liberalism grants us legitimacy, it doesn't matter, no matter what. <laughs> and you're illegitimate because you're illiberal. Therefore, you know, so, so that kind of complacency, I think, may defeat liberalism, which will be unfortunate. Um, I like to see a world where there are many different ideas of how to govern, and, 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 uh, but, but I, I mean, that will be the danger of liberal societies. Uh, um, current Chinese party and the state are not in danger of that because they are constantly in this, in, have this sense of crisis and how to deliver, and that's, that's what I mean by, by legitimacy. There's a, there's a <coughs> what you rest legitimacy on is on the one hand just an empirical question. All governments succeed only to the extent that they d deliver in some way. The, the issue that you raise with, with Taiwan, I think, go goes to the heart of a very important problem. And, and, and that is, um, if there are millions of people who want to govern themselves, does nationalism always trump self-government? Well, and uh, and, and, and uh, th that... That, that seems to me a rather urgent matter, especially since the nationalism that would trump self-government is that of a one-party state. Well, it depends. And, and that's mean, not a question of, 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 of I, I, the, the problems of liberalism are, are evident, but, that, but the fact that liberalism or, or Western societies have enormous problems, and I come from a country where we have a very, very big problem, um, starting with the president, um, um, uh, you know, the, the fact that there are problems doesn't legitimize any other form of rule. Well, 
That's exactly my point. The, prob- the fact that we have problems doesn't legitimize you <laughs> either. I'm not, I'm not asking, but, no, but I'm but not let me, asking let me you take to your, legitimize but, me. But let me take, your, you let me take your point. Me. Let me take your point. I think uh, uh, the, 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 the issue here is how you define the people, right? I mean, I define the people as the Chinese people, which includes Taiwan. So, so I mean, do you, define, do you define the Spanish people as including Catalonian people? Then, if you define Spanish people, Catalonian people as part of Spanish people, then you will say that their aspiration for self-governance would be illegitimate because people in Madrid have a say as well in Barcelona, right? So, so, so that, that, so, but I, mean, I, I know it's a debatable issue. You can debate that. You could come to me and say, Taiwan is not a part of China. I would disagree with that, but, but, but that's the issue that we're debating. But, but no, but you can still say that Taiwan is um, a part of China, but the, if, if the vast majority of Taiwanese want to govern themselves and establish their own rules. And the vast majority um, of people in Shanghai don't believe that. And we have a say in, in that too, just like the vast majority in Madrid also have a say in how Barcelonians should rule themselves. They think so, at least. But then it becomes a That's question. Of these are these are strong arguments. I'm treating them with respect. But then the issue becomes: How does this get adjudicated? Well, how does this how does this get done? We, I and understand. China that. wants I to essentially peacefully. absorb Taiwan. But the worry that everybody has externally is that beyond these issues of political theory, this will come down to a matter of force. Just as when the when the one China two countries system ends in 2047 that a lot of people in Hong Kong who'd like to remain free will not be free. And a lot of people in Taiwan who would like to be free will not in the end be free. They will be unified, but on the conditions dictated by China. That's the issue, right? And, and I don't see a story here that, that, that begins to respect the longing for democratic freedom that you see in Taiwan and that you see in, 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 in Hong Kong. That is a problem for you. It's how you get there. Even if you agreed that this is one China, you may have to live with the fact there are many Chinas. Well, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, the, 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 what, what do you mean we have to live with the idea of many Chinas? I mean, Hong Kong obviously has its own mini constitution, which I think in, almost in, in modern history is unprecedented. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, don't, I can't find an example where one nation state could be so tolerant as to have a, a sovereign territory, a part of sovereign ter- territory, completely ruled almost autonomously with its own constitution. So I think I'm optimistic mm-hmm. that we could resolve these differences uh, uh, amongst ourselves. And let me um, also help, um, if I could, uh, relieve your anxiety a little bit, as you earlier pointed out, about, about uh, the potential for Chinese dominance mm-hmm. of the world. Uh, let me say this, I will wager a bet today that in 25 years when we return for the 50th anniversary of the Nesca Conference, <laughs> um, that, <You're> very welcome. <laughs> that China will not be dominating the world at that time. Uh, and I'll wager that bet uh, for two reasons. One is because I don't believe China intends to dominate the world. And, f- and number two is even if they did, they would fail at it. Uh, because we have moved way past beyond the age of dominance. Uh, I think it's, it will be difficult for any one power to dominate the world. It's the wrong mindset. Um, and let me, if I, if I could, If I could, uh, please, let me, let, me, let me finish my train of thought. You know, in 20 some years ago, uh, I was still a youngster coming out of university. And at that time, China was just beginning to, you know, sort of barely joining the WTO, was trying to, trying to you know, emerge. Um, and and I, there was a lot of anxiety at that time, even. You know, and I read, one day I, I, I was reading the Wall Street Journal, I think, uh, on the left column. Uh, there was uh, a picture of the Chinese grand strategist, Zheng Bijian, who coined the term peaceful rise. And he said that China's aspiration is to rise peacefully. 
And I read that. I was very excited. I went out and talked to people and said, we're going to rise peacefully. You know? <laughs> and, and everybody was very, very suspicious and skeptical. And, and they attacked the idea and all of that. And to this day, I go out and say, peaceful rise. And people look at me saying, well, you know, what, what, what are you t smoking? Right? Um, <laughs> but let me just say this. In my lifetime, just in my career, peaceful rise has already happened. It's a fact on the ground. Um, we went from, since I started my career in business, we went from a poor agrarian country to a behemoth that you know that is China today. Behemoth in every respect. Okay? Yet, no country has been invaded. Not a single shot fired. No violence. And if you look at human history, the rise of every power, from Athenian Empire, to the Roman Empire, to the British Empire, to America's manifest destiny, to the rise of modern Germany and modern Japan, Ottoman Empire, every single one of them, their rise was accompanied by tremendous bloodshed, colonization, wars, massacres, okay? And China's rise to date has been bigger and faster than them all. Mm -hmm. I, but, but no war yet. So that's something to celebrate. I'm not predicting the future, but at least the achievement to date is something worthy of celebration and worthy of co co cultivating further. Yeah, I, I just as a, I mean, it's, I, I, I wouldn't disagree with the principle that's how empires get built. Uh, but the most effective form of empire building, which explains the pathology of all the world's great uh, empires, a negative thing, is always through accommodation, right? It's just the problem is historians focus on the bloodshed and the violence. So there are obviously cases where the native population of Australia is you know, essentially genocide, or mass murder anyway. But generally, the way in which things work are when people are incentivized to work with you. And that means that there are expansions of empires that are not just done through force of arms. Sometimes military is a very important threat to open up the doors, but things that are sustainable are to f about finding working exchange relationships with each other, right? So that's, how, that's, how, that's the reality of how empires really get built. And so the big question is, in what way <coughs> is this metric of China and its massive economic power, how, what kind of stake is it going to take? And what, what should it take, right? And what does it want to take? in a world that is changing very quickly, where it's a neighbor with Afghanistan, and yet has sat out of the story of the last 40, 40, 41 years, what role should China play as being part of, the back, part of the neighborhood, right? And why hasn't it played a role so far? And will it help make things better in Afghanistan? Will it make help things worse? Will it listen, and who will it listen to? in terms of shaping, you can replicate that question with every single country that China shares a border with, but obviously it's much more expanded than that well, well, the elsewhere first, too. The first step is obviously do no harm and peace. Um, and, and I think China is dabbling at Afghanistan a little bit now. They're trying to host this, this thing. Conference. Yeah, 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 but I, I don't know whether that will succeed. But, but you know, if you look at uh, in 1949, when the People's Republic was founded, uh, China had China had, I think, shared borders with 16 countries, okay, land borders, right? Uh, China had territorial disputes with all 16 countries in 1949, right? Today, that number is down to two, essentially one, India and Bhutan, and Bhutan was a part of India, okay? So, so in the last 70 years, China had settled its territorial disputes with 14 of the 16 countries she had border with all peacefully. With Russia, it was like centimeter by centimeter negotiation over a 15-year period. Yeah, the, the, the single most important that. territorial dispute, of course, is in the South China Sea, which isn't resolved. Well, I'm, I'm talking about land borders, right? Okay. So, so therefore, no, no, no. <laughs> but we have, a, we have an admiral here, but so he, he, does, he understands what the I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that's something to celebrate, isn't it? I mean, I don't, I don't see a lot of precedents in history, in all your countries, what you've done to settle your, your borders, huh? <laughs> okay. So, come on, yeah. come on, you could cut us some slack. May I, all right. may, I, may I just make a comment? Okay. First of all, with the greatest respect for China, I had, because of my previous political functions, I have many, many interactions with China. In fact, it was during my time as foreign minister 
till 95 that we negotiated with China the handover of Macau, Portugal. So, and in fact, uh, Macau was coming back to China two years after Hong Kong in 1999, and until now there has been no, no issue. And in fact, the, the relationship between Portugal and China today, I think it's a perfect relationship. So, uh, having said that, uh, just to moderate a little bit what you said, uh, Xi Jinping, and I've met him several times, present, your president, but also the previous president, in all important meetings we had as European summits with China, usually it was with the Premier, it was Wen Jibao, Li Qiang, but sometimes we had also bilateral meetings with the presidents, but almost as a rule, the Chinese said, the Chinese leadership said to me and to the other European leaders representing the European Union, we have a great respect for Europe. A great respect for the European Union, more precisely. Because you have done something in Europe that we have not yet done in Asia. A true reconciliation yes. among former enemies. The reality is that in Europe today, France, Germany, Britain, that have been, as you rightly said, during many centuries, terrible bloodshed, terrible wars. In fact, today it's almost unthinkable, I would say. While, I'm afraid to say, in Asia, China, India, Pakistan, Japan, the two Koreas, the reality is that in Asia, the level of reconciliation is much, much lower, to say, to put it diplomatically, than in Europe. So uh, that is the point I want to say. So now, after what you said about, until now, the rise of China, I share the same admiration you have for the rise of China. I really share it. I've, I've been there every year since the 80s. And it's amazing. But you said rightly that the past history of empires has been an history of aggression and supremacy and hegemony. So those of us who like to study history and political science, it's also say, now the rise of China, why would it be different? <laughs> so you say until now, externally, externally, there has not been violence. And I agree basically with that, it's true. So no invasion of countries. But how can we guarantee, now put, put yourself in the position of a, a Western power, how can we guarantee that China, now coming from those um, very important, it's the most impressive growth ever in human history, much bigger, much, much faster than the, the British, let's say, Industrial Revolution. So it was, it's a great success from a point of view of lifting people of poverty and so on. But, but now that China is becoming, let's put it frankly, much more assertive, which is natural, I think it's completely natural to be proud of some success. And I also agree with you that the the Communist Party of China until now has been extremely competent and effective in the way of keeping sufficient support uh, in the country. But how can we be sure that it will be like that? You made a bet, okay, but uh, uh, we all want to be sure about that. That's why I came back to my point. It's so important that we work together for a world based on rules. Yeah. Also, it's, it's in our fundamental interest for mankind that uh, we have uh, China committed, and now China says uh, that he's committed, and uh, uh, President Xi Jinping has made very clear commitments about that in the United Nations, even in Davos. He came to Davos, made that point. So uh, the question is, the history shows to us that empires tend to be um, assertive sometimes slash aggressive. Okay, now you say to me, and I'm sure that you are sincere, that China will be different but we have to be sure that we have a sufficient global order that can prevent us from more accidents in the future. That is my point. Yes. I want to go um, for the last half hour uh, to the psychology of uh, power. Uh, uh, Admiral Mullen, having been uh, such a top military leader, you know everything about power. What can you tell us about the psychology of power? And I also would like to know what, according to you, political leaders can learn from military leaders in terms of the ethics of power? Um, I, I think your assumption that, uh, you know, that I was sort of at the pinnacle of power is something I would uh, certainly like to debate with you in As that regard. As chairman of the chief of joint staff. Right. I, I, I guess yeah, we, we said earlier uh, in, uh, I think we were talking about Afghanistan, and certainly something I've learned since these wars is uh, whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or against terrorists, is you can't kill your way to victory. That's just 
never going to happen. And in that regard, then the pinnacle of power uh, ahead of a military that's obviously extremely powerful, uh, is it really powerful in terms of what we're really trying to generate with respect to outcomes? And I would argue that it is part of the power, but the, it, is, it is done well, it is part of a strategy that includes governance, economic advancement, rule of law, human rights, uh, your own values, respect, dignity, et cetera. Um, I mean, I found in my experience sitting in the highest offices in the United States that it, everybody's a military expert. You know, I, everybody, wants, everybody wants to talk about how many troops, how many died, how many wounded, how many more, how many have you trained. And when I would try to guide the conversation to these other factors, of governance and development, and which are really hard, and rule of law, they're, they're really hard. Military is hard enough. <clears throat> Those conversations would quickly drift back to, <clears throat> what about these number of troops? I mean, the military is just too easy to talk about in that regard, and even the question sort of hits me that way right now. I think we have to be, with respect to military power, we have to be incredibly judicious about using it and about and, and we're in an era right now where it is easier to use I mean I speak for my own country uh, and there are historians at the table that would know more about this than than I but there I have watched for the last 30 years 40 years the power of the presidency of the United States uh, one after another they just pull more and more and more into that uh, and the neutering of our legislative branch in terms of any kind of balance or check on the power of the presidency. And I think it's a really dangerous trend. And in my world, when you combine that with the lethality of weapons, the ease with which they use, the remoteness now that you can just sort of, you know, uh, intellectually disengaged and pull a trigger that's going off somewhere in the world, it's pretty scary in terms of not just what I see now, but what could be used in the future with respect to that kind of power. Um, I've also seen it used for good from the standpoint of deterrence. I mean, we, we got to the Berlin Wall because as scary and as devastating as the weapons of mass destruction you know, during the Cold War were, we, we actually never use them, um, e even though I worry now that some of them are being discussed more than I'm comfortable with uh, in a, in a post-1989 uh, time frame. Um, uh, so there's a deterrence aspect, which are, which are extraordinary. When you consider saving civilization, if you will, given the potential, th th there's an awful lot of power associated with that. And then maybe the last thing I'd say is I just never, I mean, I just never thought about power. I mean, maybe that's because I had it. Uh, um, <laughs> but I never thought about it. I never thought about it in the in the terms with which in which you asked the question, and I never really thought much about the United States, even in the position being quote unquote the most powerful uh, um, country in the world. And I'm by I much I, I thought about it much more along the lines of most capable, most influential. Uh, most critical or important in certain aspects, you know, in the lifetime that I grew up, as opposed to focusing on power. When you say power to me, though, the first thing I think of, and I spoke to this earlier, is, is just the politicians. The politicians love the power. That's why they stay in office. Uh, that moves away from, from my perspective, their ability. And when I take that versus what have you done for the people, and I speak for my own country, and, and they have missed so badly in the power that, uh, that they have accrued over the years. And then just for the record, I'm, you know, I'm 73 now, and I'm at a point where I'm ready. We've had three baby boomer presidents in you know, my generation, and I'm ready for everybody over 70 to just step aside, you know, <laughs> to move out of the way. <laughs> Don't and let, let the younger generation take over.
<laughs> okay, so we have 15 minutes left. Um, the following question, and Alexander, I, I would like you to be the first one. Listen, in history, if we, if we then consider who are you know, the greatest men and women, quote unquote, the people who really make the difference for the best, are people like Confucius or Moses or Jesus or Plato or Spinoza or Florence Nightingale or Simone Weil or Goethe or... And always people without political economic power. Always. Uh, so why are we in our culture so obsessed with the rich and the powerful? I don't understand that. Well, that's, um, is that a universal obsession? In, in, in some countries in Europe, I would say the rich and the powerful are sort of a... Uh, in Germany, I don't think they're obsessed with the rich and the powerful. I think they're, uh, and that have, probably has to do with the with the special history of of being um, of the Bundesrepublik of of the the constitution written in 1949 from scratch, basically. And since um, uh, you know the, the 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 origin myth of Germany, because none of these ancient German myths survived the Holocaust, um, the origin myth was. Uh, its constitution, and for many, many years, uh, the only form of patriotism that was acceptable was called Verfassungspatriotismus, meaning, meaning not patriotism to the country, but patriotism to the idea of the country as written down in the constitution. And and the the sort of the two uh, main uh, uh, the two main uh, special aspects of the of the constitution are a the the which are which are protected by an eternity clause, meaning they can never be changed. Um, are, is the social state principle and the uh, stipulation that property needs to serve the common good explicitly in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And this already shows the whole, the, uh, basically the entire uh, character and mentality of, of Germans is, is um, very egalitarian and very, very distrustful and critical of sort of... Um, uh, uh, the fringes in terms of very, very wealthy and very poor mm -hmm. um, situations. So I, I, I sort of disagree with this, that there's a fetish for, for, for power. And no power in Germany. Um, that's interesting. Um, Mitchell, um, American culture? The American culture. Um, I think one way to th think about the problems of American culture right now is to think of um, two, I don't want to call them both founding myths, and I don't mean myth in a negative sense here, but as a descriptive one, which um, a animate the country still, and are uh, contradictory to each other. Mm -hmm. One is the Horatio Alger myth, um, based on 19th century young boys' novels, with the vision that um, Everyone is an individualist. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and and uh, you, you can also be there, which emphasizes in the I and the individual. Contradicting that in a way is the myth of the founding of the country, where the Declaration of Independence um, ta talks about um, the rights of a people to be independent, and, um, and the Constitution, which begins with we the people of, of the United States. So, so there's a, a contradiction between a we-ness and a type of um, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which, um, and even though he didn't pull himself up by his bootstraps, um, the, 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 the type of image cast by the current American president, in, in a way, brings out that contradiction not only since he seems to think the, that the White House is part of his real estate portfolio, um, but, but, um, but um, um, th that it ser serves him and, and one of the great dangers we faced. And I should add one other thing. The, 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 the role of, while the president may attack the media all the time, um, the, the role of c um, celebrity in the culture, which is partly a, a function of... Um, of 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 uh, economics and money and um and and false gods who are s still there um, is is another crucial part of it and 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 so there are these deeply contradictory uh, cultural currents which um 
maybe it's very unclear to me as to what, where it's going to be right now. Um, the, uh, I'll quote someone I don't usually quote, Gramsci in the 1920s said the, um, the morbid symptoms that he saw in front of him, he was also, he was in prison at the time, the morbid symptoms that he saw in front of him were those of an old world dying, um, and a, but the new world hasn't been born. Um, he was fortunate because he had faith in what that new world would be, which most of us don't have anymore. We're quite disillusioned by, but, you know, um, he had the Marxist answer that clearly is, is not one. Um, but I think part, part of the current predicament is a, a difficulty in projecting where, uh, where we may end up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially since, um, well, I think we're heading into a, a constitutional crisis if we're not there in the United States. So both Alexander and Misha were talking about you know, founding myth of, of Germany and, and myth of America. Jose Manuel, you, you, yesterday you told me about when you were chairman of the European Commission that you had a project on the new narratives of, of Europe. Now, Wagner's Ring des Nimelungen was intended to, to give the German people their new myth. Uh, and out of it something horrible got out of it. But you cannot have indeed a society without a myth. You, you need the grand narrative. Now, what, according to you, should be the EU's grand narrative? Uh, I mean, I think the founding myth, in fact, uh, I mean, myth, uh, the, world is, uh, the word is a real risky because it, uh, for me, it has usually a negative connotation, but it is peace. The, 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 the idea why after the Second World War, the leaders of France and Germany, together with other countries, but including Italy and the three Benelux countries, create, and there are, after the Hague Conference, it was in this country immediately, after the Second World War, created a union, and the great, let's say, genius of, of political, that he was not a politician, it was Germany, was to try to achieve a political means, peace, through economic ends, to make interdependent, economic interdependence so strong that it will make war possible or even unsinkable. So that was the idea. A pr uh, in a pragmatic step-by-step -step approach, not creating a United States of Europe to start, because we are very different countries with very long history, so our process is different from the United States of America, uh, but to step-by-step uh, -step creating some kind of unity based on that economic interdependence. And basically, this goal has been achieved until now. That's why, by the way, I was so proud to receive on behalf of the European Union the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 in Oslo because it was a recognition that the European Union, the European as such, as a construct, has been giving an important contribution to peace. But I think now, for the new generation, in fact, that is not enough because that we take for granted. In our society, we take for granted the European Union, most, most of us, so people, the, with the with notable exception of Brexit, in fact, we, we travel around Europe. And we, there are, in fact, almost no borders and so on. So I think that we need new narratives. One of them precisely, I think we should be proud, is that the European Union has been leading the, the, the global fight against climate change. In fact, it was the European Union, basically, that put forward the most ambitious goals. At the time, I remember we were discussing in the United States of America, it was still President George Bush, George W. Bush, or with China. China was very negative at the beginning. Afterwards, there was a clear uh, evolution in the, the Chinese thinking on this matter. Uh, but in fact, we tried in Copenhagen without success. Afterwards, there was that declaration in Paris. And basically, it was Europe that was right. So I think the European young generation should be proud of what we have been doing. Now, this is not sufficient because there is an issue that everybody tells me all the time, and I know it's a problem of communication. Mm -hmm. Because we have not used the Jürgen Habermas concept. We have not a common public space in Europe. So communicating from Brussels it's extremely difficult because the same words have different, let's say, uh, connotations in different countries. In fact, one, in one of those conferences, I invited him to come to Brussels to make Umberto Eco, such a great uh, Italian and European intellectual, and he said, the language of Europe is translation. <laughs> the language of Europe is, uh, and so uh, for, when during the financial crisis, I was trying to say, let's unite. We need responsibility and solidarity. The word solidarity, was very well received in the countries under stress, but not well so, much, so well received here in the Netherlands or in Germany. 
But the word responsibility was very well received in Germany, but uh, in Greece it was not the word they wanted to use. So the same words, you see. So the same word as a complete, so that's why the commission tried, as always, muddling through, uh, so, uh, solidarity and the responsibility. So that I'm not, I'm not apologizing now. I think we, we tried, the European Union, uh, it's not from Brussels or Strasbourg that can solve the issue. The only way for the European Union to have this narrative is to have at national level the leaders, the European, the national leaders, the, uh, the, they are the stakeholders of the project to make the point. I think with the best marketing in the world, the European Union from Brussels will not achieve it. If there is not the ownership of the European narrative by our countries, and by countries I don't only mean the governments, I mean the governments, I mean the local authorities, I mean the universities, I mean the academia, I mean the opera, the opera is a, by the way a great European creation, and so on and so forth. So the ownership of the project, and, but for that narrative I would say that peace and in today's world the fight against climate change and preservation of our planet are important and sufficiently mobilizing narratives if you have the uh, stakeholders really committed to them. Thank you. Now, my final, my final question. Um, we've been talking about uh, crisis, climate crisis, other crisis. The old world is dying. Uh, Michael, you said uh, uh, institutions are failing, um, which is all part of Wagner's twilight of the gods uh, 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 phenomenon. And uh, you know, a new world has to be born. Now, Peter, in uh, in one of your books. Uh, you have a beautiful quote of a certain King Zhao, yeah. who, who must have said, I quote, a talent for following the ways of yesterday is not sufficient to improve the world today, end of quote. I think we all couldn't agree more, but what then should change? Or in Wagner's term, what are we in need of to restore an international moral order? Gosh. <laughs> um, you get the easy one. The easy one. Uh, you know, 30 years ago this morning, people woke up in Berlin and the wall was starting to be taken down. And I'm from a generation that assumed that the end of the Eastern Bloc, collapse of the Soviet Union, would, would only take place in bloodshed. Because it's not just the building of empires, the collapse of empires tends to happen in these ways. And it's been a, it's been a, a blessed 30 years, despite things that have gone happened in, in Afghanistan, which has a much longer history than 89 even. Um, I think well, the difficulty in today's world is that we, we tend to talk about countries like China, like it's one entity, right? We tend to simplify the Euro Europe into, whether it's Euro European Union or not, or Europe. You know, one can look at it both ways. You know, we were talking last night, Alex and I, about how the West Germans are not really celebrating this morning because they think the Eastern Germans are the radical right, impoverished cousins who complain a lot, and the Eastern Germans think that this also wasn't great from an Eastern German perspective. But you know, e even before the accession of, of Romania, Bulgaria, and so on, Eastern Europe is suffering the largest population loss in history, right? Because clever people from Eastern Europe migrate to countries that are wealthier, better job prospects, and they're falling fertility levels, et cetera, et cetera. So even here within Europe, we have the good story, which Jose Manuel tells very persuasively about solidarity, responsibility, the fact that we don't kill each other anymore, it's unprecedented from a historical point of view. From 1350 to 1950, there wasn't one decade that didn't involve a war in Europe. And for one reason or another, we in Europe are very jumpy as people. Very jumpy. <laughs> you know, Brexit is part of that story. We, we tend to overreact by thinking we're better off going on our own. We can't trust each other, right? And I think in this world where we are coming to the end of the, you know, the, the last 30 years of structural reform globally that, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall was very carefully studied in Beijing at the time. Very, very important role that it played in the thinking of Deng Xiaoping of opening up, not just to our, our new markets, but that the, the reforms were needed. Post Tiananmen Square as well, right? That's part of the story. But we have had this 30 years of, despite the Middle East and Afghanistan, by and large, we've all got on pretty well. You know, a child born this morning while we've been talking, anywhere in the world, will live for longer, be more literate, have access to, to clean water, uh, you know, has the best possibilities of any child ever born in history. And that's something which we are all part of. So we can, we can be down on the ways that we're coming to the end and it's got to demering and, and that this is the end of the life as we know it. There are ways in which we can learn how to work together. And, you know, taking all the in incredible experience, it's been a privilege to be part of a panel like this. And that's why the Nexus Institute is so important, to bring people from different backgrounds, different areas. You know, it, I, it just doesn't happen to me very often to have this kind of range of perspectives, 
is that uh, it's very important. I, of course, I'm selling history, right? So please study history. I'm bound to say that. But it is very important to be constantly providing that perspective and that context. So right now here in Europe and in the States, attitudes towards how important democracy is as a functional system are, are falling. You know, if, in Germany this summer, surveys put more than 40% of young people don't believe a democra democracy is, is necessary for an es essential, rather, for the functioning of a state. And these things are very, very surprising. How they're measured, how the polls are actually conducted, uh, you know, how the data is gathered is a, is a separate story, but there's something there that is showing the lack of confidence and faith in systems that we have in the West. As, as it happens, um, you know, it's not just about China and authoritarian and different kinds of systems. In 1989, if I'm not mistaken, 12% uh, of global GDP was produced in authoritarian states. Uh, today, it's about 33%, and the IMF by 2023 will have more than half of the world's GDP produced in systems that don't look like ours. Uh, the parts of the world that I travel to and work in, it's almost impossible now with a straight face to say that anybody should base their political system on the UK's. Right, where we shut down Parliament, give unlawful advice to the Queen, and, and things will be, will be, you know, they'll work themselves out, but we are clearly at a point where serious reflection, serious thought are required. And the only thing I've learned as an individual, as a scholar, as a, as a colleague in universities, is that the only way it works is by sitting and talking. And okay. higher levels of communication are vital. Yeah. At least um, that's what we're doing here and we intend to do it for the next 25 years. Um, I would like to thank you all, so please join me. <laughs>